Uh, thanks everyone for coming to this session today. Um, I just wanted to start by giving a little bit of context about the programme we run and today's workshop. So um, this is part of East Street Arts Guild programme and Guild is our sector support organisation, which is a partnership programme led by East Street Arts, aiming to transform the landscape of artist spaces in England. The aims of Guild are to support artists and artist-led organisations uh, working to support their resilience, growth and sustainability. Uh, and we support artist-led organisations with approaches to new business models, advocating for their impact on their social environments. This is part of the Guild Conversations programme, which is a series of workshops, talks, webinars and facilitated conversations programmed by East Street Arts. Uh, this programme aims to equip the artist-led sector with some tools and resources by connecting them with other artists in the sector and arts facilitators. Um, this programme runs until March and the listings for all the events can be found on our website and new sessions are going to be added regularly and then all the resources that come out of these sessions will be hosted on our website so please like keep checking back or sign up for our newsletter. This session is going to be led by Ellie Harrison of the Grief Series um, and at, uh, another housekeeping thing is at the end of the session I'll be politely asking you all to fill in a short monitoring form that will help us evaluate this session so we can make sure we continue to make improvements. If you have any questions um, throughout the day, uh, throughout this session this morning, um, please pop them in the chat. I will collect them all and then um, we can I'll pass them over to all to Ellie at the end of this hour. Um, I'd suggest putting it in speaker view if you haven't already uh, by clicking the view button on the top right hand corner of uh, the uh, Zoom window and clicking speaker view unless you want to see everyone else's faces and that's fine too. Um, so I'll pass this over to Ellie. Yeah, my connection just cut out for a second, so I missed some of that housekeeping. But um, I'm really aware that there's already like a lot of expertise in the room. Um, so yeah, this is just a chance for me to kind of share some of the things that I've come across in my practice. Um, I've called the provocation for this sexy but safe. Finding the balance between ethical participation and not killing every element of surprise or delight. Um, how do we balance these things? So as artists, how do we create safe spaces for consent? Uh, and as audiences, how do we have a sense of how to hold on to our boundaries when the live experience can unfold in unexpected ways? So firstly, I'm an artist and I make work about death <laughs> uh, and I care about audience participation. So for the last 10 years, I've been making a body of projects called the Grief Series, which is co-authored with communities and audiences. So I work hard to create ethical frameworks for my practice to exist in. And I also consult others on how to embed care into their projects. Um, I'm aware I still have a lot of uh, room for growth. So this is just a space for me to share some challenges that I've encountered and models of best practice that you can take away um, and adapt to your own needs. Um, I've, I've also kind of created some notes and a pack that will go up on the website that have some tasks that you might want to do, some further reading and some recommendations. Um, so yeah, if I stumble over my words during this, it will all be in one nice neat document. Projects um, of mine that I might mention are the unfair. So we created a fun fair about anger. So if you wanted to write a really abusive letter to your ex, you could, and then we'd bottle it up for you so you don't have to, or you could do angry karaoke with a punch bag. Um, so I might mention the unfair. The reservation was a one-to-one -one performance for hotels where I was um, Ellie the elephant or the literal elephant in the room. So that was an hour long one to one piece um, and what is left was a participatory portraiture project in collaboration with 48 members of the general public. So we went into people's homes and we took in 
portrait of them with an object they'd inherited from someone they'd lost and then we interviewed them about it and that became an audio. So I might refer back to those three projects because they've all taught me stuff about holding space for audiences to have big feelings or take risks. Uh, so a mountaineer I met said to me, the art of adventure is traveling safely in dangerous places. And I just thought that that's it. That's what I want to do with my practice. So it's a mantra that I've kept hold of for working on the grief series. You don't just ask someone to jump off a mountain and hope that the bungee cord you've provided is secure. You know, you train, you consider, you test in a safe environment and you make sure you have the right tools to hand. So I think for me, when we're talking about difficult subject matters, whether that's death or something else that is sensitive, what is the equivalent of a safety helmet and a harness? It's a, it's a question that I think is worth asking yourself when you're designing a project or an event, hosting an event. In the grief series, the process of participant care is really bespoke to each project. And I normally work with other artists in quite a bespoke way. Um, but there are threads running through that I'm going to kind of draw out today. For me, consent and care are really linked because genuine care sort of fosters trust. And by audiences consenting, it allows us to take risks as safely as possible. Um, taking risks is always risky. Like it, it just is. But I think there are things that we can do to minimise the chances of it going wrong so in order to genuinely care for an audience it isn't enough to say it like it has to be woven into the fabric of the piece from the beginning so all too often I think people approach care as something that sort of gets stuck on at the end if we have time or they use it as a sticking plaster to stick over something when it's gone wrong um, but with a subject as emotive as death and bereavement you can't just you can't just launch straight in you have to first create a ramp in and um, and then remove factors that cause anxiety to establish trust because I think yeah I think we need to be gentle with a kind of temperature taking and a ramp into these subjects and I think the environment is really key to fostering that comfort and trust. Before I give any more of this provocation I'd just like to ask if any of the things you haven't heard me say yet are likely to damage you. Because I don't want to damage you. Or maybe I should tell you what's going to happen next. In fact, no, I'm going to start again, right? I'm going to walk into the Zoom frame and um, I'll probably smile at you. And um, I'll be wearing what I'm wearing now, if that's OK. Uh, OK, so I, I'm being playful. <laughs> um, but I, I passionately believe in audience consent and how do we balance embedding consent without just totally killing the magic? Um, it would be awful if you went to a performance and they said every single thing that was about to happen before they did it. Uh, and I think part of it is about managing the audience's expectations before they even enter the space. Um, so my partner is not an artist. He likes performance, but he's shy. And I think he's okay when his role is simply as an audience member to sit and watch. But actually much of the work in contemporary performance expects a different kind of commitment from an audience. You know, it's like all or nothing engagement. If you're in, you're in and you have to go wherever the show takes you. I've seen pieces that ask vulnerable members of the audience to read other people's traumatic stories. I've been asked to raise my hand if I've suffered domestic violence in front of people that I work with. I've been an audience in pieces that ask women to raise their hands if they've experienced sexual violence, but not the men in the audience who I know definitely have. I've been in rooms where audience members are humiliated and painted into corners. And so when my partner is faced with a performance that might ask something of him that he's not comfortable to give, he opts out. But before he opts out, he often asks questions like, oh, will there be participation? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, maybe. And he asks, is there a way of you telling the artist that I don't want to, so please don't pick on me? 
Um, so he's excluded by the lack of information. And I guess even as an artist, I'm often unable to find out beforehand. And I've been thinking about what does this mean for neurodiverse people, for people who've experienced trauma, or for people who aren't savvy, but want to try something new. Not everyone might need more information, but deciding whether to attend, I, I mean, I wonder if it would be good, I wonder what the logistics would be of making details available to people upon request, and then making that really clear when you're doing your booking process. Um, I've been thinking about trigger warnings as well. Um, I think trigger warnings are helpful, but equally, they can be really intimidating. And sometimes they can be used as like a, if you decide to stay, then you just got to take it. <laughs> so I'm wondering how we can improve trigger warnings or upgrade trigger warnings. Um, yeah, I wonder if we could upgrade trigger warnings by accompanying them with mitigating support for the audience. So um, I enjoyed the trigger warning uh, at Ron Athey at Clay in 2019. It read, this performance includes nudity, bloodletting and graphic sexual content. This performance also includes costume drama, literary text, choreography and opera for various soundtrack. So I'm kind of, it's simultaneously informative, but it also dissipates the tension. Um, I wonder if trigger warnings could be added to with permission lists or rules of play. Trigger warning, this performance contains graphic sexual content. You have permission to leave and come to the bar. We'll be on hand with free snacks and cheap booze. Um, I don't have the answer to this, but I just think it's something to explore that we could explore. Trigger warning, this performance contains explicit text. Please feel free to use the noise cancelling headphones provided. Um, if you're a venue or a host, experiment with matching trigger warnings with permission lists. I suppose my instinct as an artist tells me that artists, venues and hosts' um, intention matters a great deal. It's not enough to say we care, we have to mean it and it has to be consistent with our actions. And that has to come with being prepared to hold our hands up and take responsibility if our well-intentioned plans don't play out how we expect. I also think that audiences are really clever and they can smell bullshit a mile off. But um, I suppose how we respond as an audience when we smell an intention that is more about the glory of the artist or the host than the welfare of the audience kind of needs more thought. Um, I want to be really clear and state that most of the coercive and damaging audience experiences I've witnessed have been well-intentioned. And I'm not blind to the fact that early in my career, I made some choices that I wouldn't make again now. The tricky thing is we can't see or prove people's intentions. It's like slippery. So I've been thinking about what practical steps we might take. Um, so this is a book that I really love. Uh, it's by Anne Bogart and it's called And Then You Act and although she's kind of like definitely a sort of theatre director I think what she says about performance is kind of applicable to lots of broader arts practice but on page six of her 2007 book And Then You Act she talks about art being like a stool with three legs one leg is passion one leg is technique and one leg is something to say and if one leg is less developed or secure than the others, you're going to have a wobbly piece of art. And if one leg doesn't exist at all, you're going to fall on your ass. So I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, but I think I found this analogy really vital in making complex autobiographical or trauma informed work that also tries to care for its audience. Um, so thinking about that, that stool model of the three legs, Think about how audience care relates to the passion underpinning the piece. So what are the feelings in the room likely to be? The technique, how do you say it? And um, there's something to say, what are you saying intentionally or otherwise? Um, and this, this is really helpful for me to work out where the issues lie. 
um, particularly with autobiographical work that can be bound up with somebody's lived experience. So we'll start with passion or what feelings there might be in the room and how we might hold these. In the grief series, I'm often holding spaces for people to cry or laugh or have big feelings. And this is okay and it's allowed. Um, most artists, I would imagine, want to make people feel as well as think. But I think one key thing to do is to make the distinction between something that's therapeutic and therapy. So cooking, going for a run, going to the pub with friends, they might all be therapeutic, but that's not the same as sort of seeing a qualified counsellor. Um, you don't know as a host what lived experiences they are walking in the room with, and they don't know how raw or safe the material is for you as presenters, artists, or hosts. So like say, safety first, I think for yourself and them. Um, you might have lived experience of what you're talking about. So I've been described as an experiential expert on death. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to speak on behalf of all bereaved people. Um, that doesn't necessarily give me an authority over somebody else with lived experience. Um, and it doesn't mean as well that I'm above making a mistake or saying something that upsets someone. Um, so that's why in the grief series, we always signpost um, counselling and support services as part of the artworks. So it goes in with our grief party bags, along with a slice of rosemary cake, or um, it's in a carousel topped with a golden horse in the unfair. Consider how you distribute signposting as well. So do I've thought a lot about, like, do the audience have to visibly actively take it? Or is it given to everyone? Because, I mean, <laughs> if you imagine handing someone who is crying or upset a counselling leaflet might not read as the caring gesture you intend it to. Um, a leaflet stand in a really exposing place will remain untouched. And a pin board that uh, in a dimly lit room that requires an audience to walk right across the room and then like copy information down is actually really intimidating for someone when they're struggling, I think. Um, so I tend to try and sort of uh, include it in a in a sense of gift. So along with other things, it's one it's one thing amongst others, um, because otherwise it can. I suppose I'm worried that the intention will be that it will come across as ask covering, like. If you, if you get fucked up by this, it's your problem. It's actually like, this might be helpful or it may not be like, give it to a friend, throw it in the bin, do what you want with it. But there's also part of kind of gift and art. And here are a number of things that I'm offering to you that you can use or not use. So put it in the program um, or exhibition info or wind it in with the art, make it a bundle or a gift that the audience can take away with them. I'm also, um, really clear as well that I'm not a trained counsellor and I don't want to be. Um, I'm a layman that's really happy to talk and really happy to listen. Um, so I operate more in a citizen to citizen model um, because I think, you know, just by, if we know a bit of first aid, we're not pretending to be paramedics. And by talking about death or other sensitive subjects, we're not pretending to be grief counsellors but we all need to cultivate a sense of being able to listen with empathy. Um, and actually there's a really fantastic um, festival, a death festival called Pushing Up Daisies in Todmorden and they've championed a citizen to citizen model of bereavement training. So they uh, train up a group of volunteers um, to feel comfortable and relaxed um, talking about death and then when you go to the festival anyone wearing a daisy badge you know you can approach them if you're feeling uncomfortable or you've got a problem or you're feeling upset and they'll kind of be on hand and that's I guess much more of an activist strategy but I'm I think it's an interesting one saying we're not counsellors but we are really happy to chat um, I've also heard of people using things like insecurity guards which I I mean, I love the pun, right? But um, yeah, that's another interesting sort of P 
peer or activist strategy for looking after your audience. Um, I think it's really important to think about how you communicate your role and anything you definitely aren't to an audience uh, and how they might access trained support if they need it. Um, I know of one project where they hired a counsellor as a kind of mental health first responder to be there at every event. Um, so that's that's something that that's something that I think people need to think about earlier. Like they need to think about it before they put their arts council bid in so that there's money in there, not get to the day before the show and go, oh, what do we do if an audience gets upset? Um, so next I wanted to talk about technique. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the Fry's consent model if you haven't already encountered it. Um, I encountered this through the work of Jenny Wilson. Um, so on the pack, there's a link to her website and her work on consent. And for me, the Fry's consent model has really given me a clear framework for articulating the way that I was sort of already working um, in embedding care in my own and other people's projects. But I mean, I love a framework. It, I suppose I, I like things that can help you make sense of something that can often feel like complex or muddy or overwhelming. Um, so Fries, F-R-I-E-S. Um, consent is in place when it's freely given, all parties have full capacity con to consent and nobody is pressured, manipulated or coerced. Reversible. Consent may be withdrawn or retracted at any point, and it's clear to all parties at which point a consensual transaction is completed. Informed, all parties understand fully what they are consenting to and any risks relating to it. Engaged, there is clear communication and a positive agreement to proceed and continue. And specific, with limitations and boundaries understood by all parties. So this really informs how I work with collaborators as well as audiences and participants. So once you have a plan for your project or event, I think it's really helpful to spend an hour thinking about how any points in the project where you might need to build in more care or temperature taking, you know, where are the points where consent might be breached or where are the opportunities to make it better, make your process more transparent. Um, and equally, I've also found it really helpful when trying to pinpoint what went wrong. So in my experience, if something just felt a bit off or a bit uncomfortable, it's often because one or more parts of the, comprise, uh, the Fry's consent model weren't there. Um, and I think particularly in, in my personal experience, there's something about the reversible nature of consent there that is, nine times out of ten when people come to me with a problem it's because they haven't the consent hasn't been reversible um, so uh, care in theatres or galleries is kind of often governed by physical walls so we care for you while you're on the premises but not before and not after I mean and I guess there's a pleasing clarity there for audiences and artists until it goes wrong. Until people experience something triggering in the space. I think it's important as hosts to think about, is there a quiet-ish, private-ish decompression space you can make outside the main experience? So if people opt out or have to leave, there is somewhere comforting they can go. Um, I was in a site-based piece about trauma and I'll be honest like I I thought I was quite dead inside but it really triggered me and I totally lost my shit but I couldn't leave because it was an unfamiliar part of town there was nowhere to go there was no theatre bar there was no taxi rank so I just stayed um, and it would have been really great if there had been a quiet space where I could have gone to have a drink and waited for the friends that I'd come in with so that we could all go home together rather than me just having to like stand in the cold outside for an hour or not knowing how to communicate with my friends that were still inside. So um, create decompression spaces and consider having staff member there to hold space a bit. And um, consider that if there's any specific training 
your staff might benefit from. So if an audience member walks out, is there a member of staff on duty kind of as a first responder to ask them what they need? Um, and sometimes they might not know, but I think it's, it's just worth thinking about. Uh, digging deeper into spatial rules and permissions, there's usually a set of unspoken rules for spaces like theatres and galleries, and these kind of both govern how we move through the space. So, for example, you don't scream in a gallery, but on a roller coaster, it's fine. You can crouch on the floor in a library with a book, but not in a supermarket with a raw chicken. Um, and this governs this kind of these spatial rules. They also govern who feels at home, allowed or right in that space. So I think it's really important that we consider which audiences might feel vulnerable in your space and also who might feel more than usually entitled. Like having a space that's really familiar to you is, is good up to a point, but I think um, when people feel too relaxed, it can slip into entitlement and that, that's like a little bit of a red flag. Like I've noticed myself feeling entitled in certain spaces that I feel very comfortable in. So I think we just need to watch for that. Um, I work in uh, site-based and outdoor environments. And I think really carefully about how the site creates a sense of comfort and challenge and to who. So, um, to gift people agency over their experience, I'm always looking for spaces that are visually beautiful and interesting to attract people. So I'm drawn to the everyday things that might trigger memory or engagement. So to a place that feels in some way familiar, like a, a hotel, a fun fair, a caravan that evokes childhood holidays. So I think about the aesthetic as part of the audience care. How can I create a visually welcoming environment? And I consider not just what an audience see, but what they smell, taste and touch. Um, interior designer Ilsa Crawford, there's a really great abstract um, documentary about her on Netflix. She says the empathy is the cornerstone of design and each element of the world. So sorry, she says empathy is the cornerstone of design. Full stop. I can't punctuate. So um, and so for me, every element of the world I create is scrutinized for its textual impact. So um, I really think about how the space I'm creating makes the audience feel. Uh, I guess I'm also trying to bring art to people where they are and 99% of the time for free so that they can engage on their own terms without money being a tool to keep them in the room. I've been thinking about ticket prices and what that means in terms of consent. If I've spent 13 pounds on a ticket, it is gonna keep me in the room, sometimes when it shouldn't. Whereas if something's free, it kind of encourages people to take risks, but also gives people, you know, free reign to opt out as well. Uh, still looking at technique, next comes structure for participation. Um, if you think about games, they combine structure and spontaneity, and in theory, they allow things to play out smoothly. Um, so, yeah, like when you go into a game, you have a sense of what you might be able to expect. I'm always looking for something with enough structure to feel like a clear invitation, but enough freedom for people to express themselves. So generally talking about a difficult subject matter and giving audiences free reign um, it can be difficult. Like in my experience, sitting down in front of someone and going, so death, go, is, is not a good invitation. It's, it's too wide, it's too free. They feel exposed and like they don't know where to start and they don't know what's allowed. So I'm trying to find an accessibility, an emotional accessibility ramp in for people, which is about what is the what is the right amount of structure, just enough structure to free people up. So in the reservation, we use prompt cards. Um, so rather than me asking someone for their stories, I had all my questions on prompt cards and I would hand them to the audience member and say, um, 
here's prompt cards, pick one that, that you want to start with. And then I'd say, well, okay, do you want to start by sharing your story or would you like me to start? So they had absolute control. They, they literally held the cards. They had the cards in their hand. And that what I noticed is that really allowed people to go at their own pace because they had their own expertise of how to care for themselves. It was just about empowering them to do that. So some people would go, I'll answer this one. There's no way I'm answering that one. This one's difficult. I'll come back to it later. Or someone would get themselves into a very emotional place and then they'd decide, OK, next question. So it really was about how can we how can we trust audiences that they know what they're doing and they have their own level of expertise? Um, yeah, they were able to navigate themselves into safer territory. We also use prompt cards in what is left as a strategy to generate audio interviews that were kind of all related in theme, but they weren't formulaic. Um, and participants could choose questions from a range of options. So people had their own sort of tool for wayfinding. Um, in the unfair, the prompt cards were transformed into angry Jenga. So we made this angry Jenga set with prompts on um, to consider if anger was a negative emotion or a catalyst to positive change. So, um, yeah, they were developed in the reservation. And it's something that I've come back, back to again and again. Um, I guess it's multiple choice. Essentially, it's using multiple choice structures as a way of empowering audiences and caring for them. Um, if you're working with audiences who might respond in unpredictable ways, which I guess is more likely in public space, but also it's really possible in theatres and galleries, it can be helpful to have some safety mechanisms in place. Um, if you and your team aren't safe then neither are the audience as a whole like you have to keep yourself and your facilitators safe um, and you because if you're not safe you can't hold the space for other people um, so we've used traffic light cards with audiences um, so at any point they can either point to or say Green, I'm fine, keep going. Amber, let's keep going, but tread carefully. We're in dangerous territory. And red, like we need to stop or we need to renegotiate. Um, so that tr using traffic light cards with audiences is one technique. Um, but if you're using it, it's really important that it's explained well and that people feel empowered to use it and that the team facilitating also use it. Um, I saw one instance of someone using a traffic light, well, a facilitator setting up a traffic light card system. And then when one of the audience members used it, they sort of, the facilitator sort of ignored it because they didn't, they didn't want to, they wanted to go where the show wanted to go. And it's like, okay, if you're going to do it, you have to do it properly. <laughs> commit, <laughs> commit and work out what would happen if your audience stop. Um, We've also used something called elephant cards that we developed in the reservation. Um, you, we, me, the performer and the person taking part had an elephant card that you could play. So it was basically a picture of an elephant on a stick that you could place in front of your face. Um, and there was something, we tried to make those playful. There was something playful about it. And there was something about the fact that I had one as well so that people could put it in front of their face in case they didn't want me to see them crying or in case they needed a minute. Um, and actually they very rarely got used, but people fed back that the fact that they had that get out, they had that uh, mechanism that they could play actually helped them stay in the room because they felt in control and they felt there was a transparent system that they could use. Um, if you're performing in public space, you might want to have ushers or people outside the main action who can interact more freely, sort of guiding the audience and protecting performers. Um, safety words. I think safety words are great within teams. Um, in Disneyland, uh, 
apparently the Dis the people that are Disney princesses or Disney figures, if they do this, it's a sign that they're in trouble and immediately ushers and people come and help them. And uh, I actually think that's it's really smart to have a way of communicating with your team, particularly when you're doing stuff in the public realm. Um, uh, there's a youth development project that had the code that if I ask you what the time is, it means I'm in trouble, come and help me. So it's this, it's this thing that's invisible to the audience, but it allows the facilitators to care for each other and to stop things spiraling out, um, out of hand. They help teams to communicate with other and hold their own boundaries. As you develop a project, consider inviting test audiences in. So potentially audiences that you know and love into a similar environment to allow work to bed in and audience participation issues to be tested and resolved. Like don't, don't just think, oh, we'll just do it on the day and it'll happen. I tend to start with test audiences that I really trust and then work outwards. So I'm continually refining it going oh that that didn't play out quite safe enough or um yeah it's I think it's important to use test audiences um, a conversation with test audiences early on allows you to notice problem areas and see patterns of where things get difficult so um yeah I work firstly with people I know and trust who can be honest and and also people that will be accepting if I mess up or fail early on and then I gradually widen the pool of people and um, in the pack, I put um, a Liz Lehrman feedback structure, which is a way of um, getting really productive feedback and having a really open conversation with audiences. Um, so you can find that in the pack that we'll put online. OK, last thing. I've talked for a long time. You're, you're still with me. You're doing a good job. Um, something to say. Do you have skin in the game or lived experience of what you're talking about? And do the audience know this? So in my practice, I often use autobiography um, as a kind of opening offer, meaning I'm taking the plunge first and then audiences can decide if they want to reciprocate or not. Can people tag out and in using traffic lights, elephant cards? If they do tag out, where can they go to to feel safe? Where can they wait for friends? And um, sometimes people will actively try and break the experience or it will trigger them. And it's important to consider the safety of the person having the big feelings, whether you think they're justified or not, the people performing and facilitating and the rest of the audience. Um, I think hosts and venues uh, need to actively check with the artists about triggering content um, because that's a real issue that I've been aware of that things have happened within an artwork that the hosts aren't aware of ahead of time. Um, and so nothing's been put in place. Um, I feel like actually a lot of what I'm saying today, you might think, oh, well, this should go without saying, but it's actually really common. People come to me a lot. People pick up the phone to me a lot going, this awful thing's happened. What do I do about it? Or I was hosting an event and it got out of hand. Um, and I'm also aware that talking about this work is really difficult in a big group setting um, because without exposing kind of individuals um, or sharing kind of private things. But we have I have like created some slots. So if you want anyone wants to have a private conversation with me to follow up afterwards, uh, you're more than welcome. So hypothetical example. An audience member is triggered and starts being racist, misogynist, homophobic, which in turn exposes the rest of the audience to that racism and in, or, or homophobia or misogyny. And in particular, people that in the audience that might have lived experience of this. So that's one, that's one hypothetical nightmare situation. You did something that incited an audience to trigger another audience member uh, like you gave an instruction to the audience, which makes an audience member touch somebody inappropriately. Like we need to be thinking through these nightmare situations 
like way ahead of time, like during our creation process, during our hosting process. And we need to build facilitating non-compliance into your plan, like rather than trying to kind of negotiate that live. Because the choices you make live may or may not be good. It's much better, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't send a paramedic to go and care for someone in a really risky situation without giving them any training. Like we need to be training ourselves. We need to be thinking ahead. And um, play what I call is the Eeyore game of like, what is the worst thing that could happen? And then consider if your response was worth keeping or adapting. Like it, there's a kind of weird fun that can be had with this Eeyore game. Like the longer you play it, the more you realize actually there's there's sort of simple things, simple solutions that you can or implement in your project. And also by facing your fears of like, what is the worst thing that could happen? You're way less likely for those fears to become a reality. So I really advocate playing that, that Eeyore game. Um, are there members of your team on the outside of your experience as a kind of bridge, ushers, insecurity guards, producers, um, do ushers model how the audience should behave or help guide them to follow the rules of engagement? Are they like model participants? It's a possibility. How do you communicate visibly or invisibly amongst your team? Um, so I had an example of a producer saying there was something unfolding between the performer and an audience member in public space. And as the producer, they didn't know whether this was the best bit this was the edgiest bit, this was the most interesting bit, or whether the performer inside needed help. So they, they, they backed off because they didn't want to break the art, but actually they had no way of knowing. So having these safety words or these ways of communicating. Um, and I think then the last thing I want to kind of say is recognize the difference between tone and content. You can do violent things in a soft tone of voice. I think it's a big mistake that a lot of people make. They think if they speak softly, then the content doesn't really matter. It does. <laughs> um, and also consider if you might be tone policing your audience as well. I think it's important to think. Um, consider your privileges and intersections so that you're aware of your blind spots. We need to be aware of our intersections and privileges. So like, I have white privilege and I also sound kind of middle or upper class, which means I don't generally have to code switch when I'm talking to funders or venues. Um, on the other hand, I live with chronic illness. I've experienced sort of significant repeated trauma. I inhabit a fat body. I'm a carer and I'm economically precarious. Um, and, you know, in the art sector, we live in a culture of free work and exploitation. So it's really important that we learn about ourselves and which privileges are visible and which privileges are invisible and where people might misread us. Um, and this includes our kind of collaborators, funders and audiences potentially misreading us. How can we use art to make visible um, the context? How can we unpick assumptions people might have about us and how do we try and acknowledge we do this too, we make judgment calls all the time. Um, because what is said and how that is interpreted sort of depends on who's saying it. Um, yeah, so for example, I dress, I dress like the queen often, um, but I have had days where I can't afford to eat, but people wouldn't know that by looking at me and my disability is invisible. So I got, once got really hurt by um, a very successful, rich working class artist taking a dig at me for being posh when he earns five times as much as me um, he judged me but then I you know I checked myself and I thought well in fairness I am dressed like Professor Umbridge from Harry Potter so you know it's complicated um, and it requires a creative response uh, no you can make spaces sa safer and braver but you can't totally predict the future you can't it's nearly impossible to make a totally safe space so we need to move past that and I know there's a lot of expertise in the room about that um, and be prepared to be accountable so this looks like listening carefully listening to your gut listening carefully to the audience 
Um, you may need to create spaces outside of or at the edge of creative processes for you to be heard as a host or a maker, like you might want a mentor or a counsellor or an outside eye in order for you to be able to listen to what your audience is telling you, because it might be difficult what they're telling you. Um, trust that your audience aren't making it up. If they are challenged, believe them. Um, and resist the urge to jump to defensiveness, which I know is easier said than done. Um, where someone else's feelings are hurt, resist the urge to send to yourself. Say sorry and mean it. If in doubt, listen and listen again. Um, and I'm just going to end with uh, an Anne Bogart quote, because she's great. And she's an easy read as well. Um, Of course, I've lost my place. Uh, art can expand the definitions of what it means to be human. So if we agree to hold ourselves to a higher standard and make more rigorous demands on ourselves, then we can say in our work, we have asked ourselves these questions and we are trying to answer them. And that effort earns us the right to ask you, the audience, to face these issues too. Art demands action from the midst of living and makes space where growth can happen. There we are, you made it, you made it, an hour of me talking. And um, so I don't know if, Matt, you've collected any questions, thoughts, anything. Hello. Um, Hi. I will end the recording and then if anyone has any more specific questions, they can also pop them in the chat, but at the moment we don't have any questions.